Good morning. It's Thursday, the 23rd of May, and this is Govind Rajati Raj broadcasting and streaming from and headquartered in Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day the stock markets are holding higher, but valuation fears are spreading. Why you should be worrying about price to earning ratios and what do they mean? The Reserve Bank of India transfers 210,000 crore rupees to the government. The number is much more than projected and expected. Indians are blowing more money traveling overseas despite increased restrictions. And order books for India's exporters have jumped in recent months. What is driving this? This is a core report with Govindraj Athiraj. Valuation fears are spreading. So, the stock markets have held the $5 trillion market capitalization mark in Wednesday's trade. With continued exuberance comes apprehension, particularly amongst institutional investors who tend to have memories and who have seen boom and bust cycles. Technically, valuations are at an all-time high in many major markets across the world right now. And that's more than a dozen, by the way, including India, as we discussed earlier. But as you keep peeling off the layers of the onion, so to speak, then questions start to arise. How are companies quoting at price to earnings ratios of more than 100, particularly when they belong to traditional industries or businesses, and there is no sign of achieving that earnings growth to match the stock price or the stock price to match the earnings growth and more of that in a moment. Now, institutional memory, just to come back to that, as they say, can be a good thing because it prevents you from taking wild bets, but it can be a bad thing because it prevents you from taking wild bets. The interesting thing is that all the panic we saw, including with the market regulator, the Securities and Exchange Board of India over runaway mid caps and small cap stocks appears to have dissipated for now. Remember, mutual funds were asked to do stress tests on what would happen if investors suddenly wanted to pull out their money. Well, they clearly have not and the markets are still going up. So who is the genius here? I don't know, as I too suffer from an institutional memory problem. Anyway, on Wednesday, the BSE Sensex closed the day at 74,221, up 268 points, while the Nifty 50, on the other hand, was up 69 points at 22,598. In the broader market, which we now track more closely than in previous months, the BSE mid cap fell slightly, while the BSE small cap rose slightly. So while the Sensex and Nifty, the benchmark indices, are still below their all-time highs, the overall market has grown more, which is better reflected in the mid-cap and small-cap indices, and thus also a reflection of the sheer rise in valuations. Just to glance back at the benchmark indices, the BSE Sensex has risen about 20% over the last one year. The Nifty 50 has gained about 24%. In the broader markets, the Nifty mid-cap 100 has gone up 60% in the last one year. The Nifty small-cap 100 about 70%. On the other hand, if you just look at flows, the Economic Times says, for instance, that ever since voting for Lok Sabha elections began on April 19th, foreign institutional investors have sold about 38,000 crores worth of Indian stocks or about 1,800 crore rupees worth of stocks sold per day in the last 21 trading sessions. All of this is reflecting the increased nervousness on the Lal Street on a probable outcome of the Lok Sabha elections. The market's fear gauge or the India VIX has now shot up by about 67% to fresh 52-week high levels, says the Economic Times. Now, all of this may mean nothing or it may mean something since the markets have also priced in a victory for the current government. Why do price-to-earnings ratios matter and what do they mean? So, the question is, why should we be thinking so deeply about market valuations and how do we go back to some basics to understand how they're measured and how do they compare with the past or anything for that matter? So, I reached out to G. Chokalingam, veteran market analyst and founder of Economics Research, and I began by asking him first to give us a bit of an explanation and a primer on what price-to-earnings ratios mean in the context of valuations and share prices that we are seeing currently and, more importantly, where it could go. You know, any asset you buy, there is always a, you know, underlying value and you have a tool to measure it. You know, if you buy a real estate, you go for a square foot, what is the price and what is the location? These two things matter. So for every asset class, uh, that is the way some, you know, tool is available to value its uh, worthiness. When you come to equity, behind equity, you have a company running the business. So you have to see what is the profit the company is making and what is the profit per share. What is a profit per share of the company? 
So that is what called earning per share. So if company is earning 100 crore profit and there are 10 crore number of share, the EPS is 10 rupees. Then comes to the valuation. So how much price I can pay? How many times this profit per share you can pay? So you pay 20 times. You decide to pay 20 times. So the profit per share is 10. So 20 multiplied by 10. So you, you are willing to pay 200 rupees price. So here the 20 is the PE ratio, price to earning ratio. So price to earning ratio is nothing but how many number of times, you know, the profit company makes per share, you are willing to pay for the company as a price. So that is what PE ratio. But unfortunately, a lot of uh, new investors, they don't look at, you know, the valuation at all. They're just seeing the momentum in the stock and then, then uh, blindly buying. So that is uh, quite uh, dangerous things to do. So let's come to the present and people have been again talking about valuations. Now the Sensex and Nifty are obviously still short of their all-time highs, but the broader market has expanded. We've crossed $5 trillion in market capitalization, a figure which you had also projected and predicted the last time I spoke to you. So why are the current valuations that we are seeing causing so much concern? And again, right now. Yeah, so we spoke about the P ratio, that is, you know, how many number of times you are willing to pay the profit the company makes to buy a share. Then there is another concept of market cap, which is nothing but price multiplied by number of shares. So that is the total value of the company. And all the listed companies, you total it, you get the market cap of aggregate market. Now the aggregate India's market to market cap is 416 lakh crore, which is $5 trillion. Now that's a remarkable achievement. We should feel happy about it. There's no doubt about it. But the problem is, how this is built up, you know, in 2014, the market cap was around 84 lakh crore, 2014 May. So now it is 416 lakh crore. But since 2020 bottom, March bottom, that is where we had a crisis on account of COVID, the market cap has increased from 160 lakh crore to 416 lakh crore. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, the incremental market cap has come largely from the small and mid-cap stocks. Now, the small and mid-cap stocks, you know, if you look at the just index stocks, they are about 150 lakh crore out of this 416 lakh crore, small and mid-cap. Now, problem comes from two things. One, the market cap itself is a so huge, and today it is 200% of the bank deposits. It is 130% of India's uh, GDP or India's income. Now, when the market cap is surging, you know, what happens? There comes a problem of liquidity. The liquidity available in the system doesn't grow along with the market cap. It grows very slowly over a period of years, decades. Now, the problem here is at 416 lakh crore, if there is any fear, that's what happened in COVID, the fear came. Now, if there is any fear, even 2% of the market cap comes up for selling. The 2% of this 416 lakh crore is about 8 lakh crore. Rough estimate per day, you don't get more than 10,000 crore rupees into the market as a fresh flow. And 20 days market is open. So maximum in a normal market itself, you can get only 2 lakh crore in a month's time. But if there is a fear, I am assuming too low selling pressure, that is just 2% of the market cap, which is about 8 lakh crore, you need 4 months to absorb this kind of market cap without hammering the market. So whenever there is a fear, there is a chance that the market cap can erode very badly. The second is the P ratio. There are many small and mid-cap stocks, they are trading at 50 to 100 P. And the problem is, even that one can justify, the corresponding profit growth is about 50 to 100 percent. But what is happening in many stocks, if P ratio is, say, 80, the profit growth is not even 40. The theory says, if you are paying a 80 P, see that the profit grows at 80 percent. But there are many cases, most of the cases, if P ratio is 80, the profit doesn't grow even half of that. If P ratio is 40, the profit is not growing even half of that at 20%. So these are the two big problems. And that is because 10 crore new investors have come in in the last five years roughly. And most of them, end, end investors, they are attracted by the momentum and they are not looking at the valuation multiple. They are not looking at the fund of market cap to GDP or bank deposits or peg ratio. P ratio. So therefore, it's a quite risky zone. Eventually, they have to correct. We don't know when the four year in a row it is rallying. But whenever the fear comes, the end results will be very bad. 
That's what history says. Ever since small cap index was floated by BSE, invariably, once in two to three and a half years, roughly, there was a major fall in the small cap. So it is waiting to happen in my Right. So one of the factors which perhaps has changed is the supply of funds. And, you know, there is consistent money coming into the markets through systematic investment plans and so on. So isn't that in some ways likely to offset any potential selling, even if there is one? Very good uh, point. And it's actually, today, the FIs are selling, all of us know, continuously they are selling for more than a month, despite that the market is not crashing, because as you rightly said, the new investors are coming, direct to equity, also through mutual fund. But what happens, we are seeing a perception-driven rally. We have seen a couple of times, one day, two day fear, but we have not seen a mass fear, you know, on the valuation of the market or particularly, I am very comfortable on the whole market. I don't ever expect the whole market to crash, but I expect only the small cap to fall badly. So the problem is through SIP, 16, 20,000 crore, even if it comes to the market, which is nothing as compared to 150 lakh crore market cap built up by small and mid cap indices. So it is good in a rising market, it helps you, you know, but when the fear comes, I have a doubt whether even 16, 20,000 crore per month would be enough, particularly when the FIs are selling. So it's a good, it's a sign of massive structural change, you know, in terms of number of investors which I covered, also in terms of quantum of money coming to stock market through direct investment as well as through mutual fund and particularly SIP note. It's a good thing because it will minimize the dependence on FIIs. You know, they are outflow only crash of market post Lehman crisis and also in COVID time. So to that extent, it is good. But my apprehension is that the magnitude of money still coming through SIP, the 16,000 crore per month, is still not enough, you know, as compared to the market cap built up in a small and mid cap. You know, the small and mid cap indices are not open for 150 lakh crore and overall market cap 416 lakh crore, 416 lakh crore. So, if any fear comes to the extent of even 2-3% selling, even the 16,000 crore is not enough from the public because if a domestic industry also add another 10,000 crore, so 26,000 crore per month is not enough to absorb even 1% shock coming from the market. No, 1% of the 416 lakh crore will be about 4 lakh crore. So even after this jump, it's not enough to manage any risk coming from the destruction of the perception, good perception. Right. Chokan, I think that's very useful to know and also puts things in perspective. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. Elsewhere, the Securities and Exchange Board of India has issued fresh guidelines to manage stock market's impact rising out of market rumors, according to a circular dated the 21st of May. The purpose of this is to exclude price disruption caused by rumors while arriving at the price for an acquisition in a mergers and acquisition situation or a buyout situation. The regulations will be applicable to the top 100 listed entities with effect from June 1st and the next 150 starting December 24th. The regulation requires that the listed entity verify market rumors once there has been a material price movement. Now, all of this is somewhat important because markets are subject to or rather see a lot of rumors which in turn affect prices and is something that you should also be careful about. In this regard, the SEBI circular states that unaffected price shall be considered for transactions on which pricing norms specified by the regulatory body or the stock exchanges are applicable. Now, what is this unaffected price, you might ask? Unaffected price here implies the share price that would have existed if there was no rumor in the market. And there is, of course, a computation for it. And why is this important? Because potential buyout or M&A deals often get reported by media before the formal announcement, causing a surge in the target company's stock price. Now, this results or could result in a higher open offer price, which makes the acquisition more costly for the acquirer. So, this disruption in stock prices or the shifts in stock prices would be excluded when determining the open offer price. Nothing obviously happens to the stock price itself. Now, back now to the currency markets. The rupee inched up to about 83 rupees 22 paise per dollar on Wednesday, which is the highest since April 10th. Some research reports are suggesting that the Reserve Bank may let the rupee appreciate slightly, though recent history also suggests that the overall movement in the rupee is very limited or has been very limited and narrow, also making it amongst the least volatile amongst many currencies, including in the region. Oil prices slip again. 
Oil prices are down again after an industry report suggested that the United States crude inventories are rising, according to Bloomberg. In general, U.S. crude inventory is an important signal for oil prices. The higher the inventory, the lower the crude oil prices, at least relatively. Brent crude is now about $82 a barrel, near its lowest in three months after the American Petroleum Institute reported crude stockpiles rose by about 2.5 million barrels last week, said Bloomberg. Overall, Brent prices are around 7% higher so far this year. Prices are, of course, stable, all things considered, particularly given the heightened geopolitical risks which continue to impinge on prices, and these include drone strikes on Russian refineries affecting supply directly. The Reserve Bank of India transfers more funds than expected to the government. The Reserve Bank of India is set to transfer about 210,000 crores as surplus to the central government for the accounting year 23-24, the central bank said in a press statement. Now, that figure is much higher, almost 140% than what was generally estimated and projected by analysts, which was around 100,000 crore rupees. So the contingency risk buffer has been hiked to 6.5% from 6% previously. Last year, the central bank transferred about 87,000 crores to the center as surplus. The Economic Times reports that as per interim budget documents for the ongoing financial year, the government had budgeted a dividend of about 102,000 crore rupees from the Reserve Bank of India, public sector banks and other financial institutions. So what does all this mean? Economists say that this sum or the additional sum gives the government more elbow room to manage any welfare spending and sustain its high levels of capex spending, particularly if proceeds from disinvestment are low, which of course will be low since hardly any disinvestment has happened in the last year. A Kotak Mahindra Bank economist told Reuters that higher interest rates on both domestic and foreign securities, significantly higher gross sale of foreign exchange and a little impact from the central bank's liquidity operations possibly led to such a high dividend. Now, the level of surplus of profits the Reserve Bank's pays to the government has been a somewhat contentious issue in the past. The government has naturally sought higher payouts, saying the Reserve Bank was maintaining reserves or capital buffers that were much higher than what other global central banks were holding and that it, being the government, could put these funds to better use, for example, in projects, physical or otherwise, for the benefit of the common man. The quantum of the transfer has been the subject of debate, not the transfer itself. The issue is a live one in many countries. Indians are spending overseas like never before. Travelling Indians spent close to $32 billion overseas last year, marking a 17% increase from the $27 billion the year before. The increase in spending persisted despite implementations of measures such as tax collection at the source, a presumptive tax, which was aimed at curbing overseas expenditure, according to a report by the Times of India. So the figures obviously suggest that despite everything, Indians continue to love and continue to travel extensively overseas which in itself is not so surprising given the high cost of travelling domestically, including high hotel costs, and on the other side, an increasing number of affordable destinations, including newer ones from Vietnam to Kazakhstan, within four to five hours of direct flights from cities like Mumbai and Delhi. Indians spent about $17 billion specifically on international travel last year, up almost 25% compared to the roughly $13.5 billion spent in the previous year. Amounts spent on overseas education appear to be falling, it appears, though it's not clear to me how and why because anecdotal evidence suggests otherwise. More on that at a later date, including if spending categories are shifting. The TOI report said Indians have allocated larger amounts towards supporting relatives overseas, totaling about $4.5 billion, which was higher than the expenditure on fees. Order books for Indian exporters are looking strong. There has been some concern about overall merchandise or physical export numbers, but the overall picture is looking better than before. India's total goods exports in 23-24, that's the last financial year, fell about 3% to $437 billion from $451 billion in the previous year. But this year, as things look right now, could be better and it's turning. And the interesting thing is that this is happening despite all the geopolitical tensions and logistics challenges, which are of course affecting some industries, but not all. So many markets, including Europe and the United States, are stepping up their imports and thus boosting India's exports. Export order books are up anywhere between 15 to 20% for industries like footwear. 
I spoke with Chennai-based Rafiq Ahmed, chairman of Farida Group, one of India's largest shoe manufacturers and exporters, and I began by asking him how he was seeing current demand trends. Mostly the demand is coming from US market. US market is picking up well. Is much more for the footwear. Footwear business getting better now. And uh, as far as Europe is concerned, Europe is not picking up as much as the U.S. Now, if you say 20% for U.S., I can give you around 8 to 10% for uh, Europe. Mainly because U.K., the economy is bad and uh, they are not much uh, in their demand. But anyway, the overall, we are seeing a business picking up between U.S.A. and Europe together. In particular, footwear industry, it is better. Why do you feel this is happening? My sense is that this is unusual. At least the rise seems to be unusual. No, for us, we expected this. One is because they had a lot of inventory. During, after the post-COVID, they bought, they started buying like hell. And they finally realized that they cannot be able to dispose of, sell it out in the shop. And they stopped it the last six, seven months to see that the inventories go down. And that has gone down also. Now they are in level now. And plus, that is one reason. Second reason is that they are also feeling very uncomfortable at the moment to buy from China. The policies, the policies which is coming up from U.S. government towards China, they are afraid tomorrow some countervailing duties are put up. Then it will become more difficult for them to go buy. So they are looking for some other alternatives. The first choice they give it always is for the Vietnam. Vietnam, they go there first. But Vietnam is already full. The whole production capacity is not there at the moment. Then Cambodia is too small. Cambodia is a very small country and they are also full. Now they are looking for India. They, they have a problem with India. First of all, with communication, with thing, the distance, everything. they have, But still, in spite of that, they are feeling that India is going to be one of the supplier, main suppliers in the future. That is why they are now placing order. We are also getting a lot of new customers who had never been looking at India. They are also coming in to buy it from India. And so, what, which country which benefits out of this away from China is India and Bangladesh seems to be getting more business out of them. And uh, that is why we are seeing a small jump in the demand. And uh, I said uh, 20%, almost uh, up to 20% increase we are seeing in the... And that is reflecting in our capacity utilization now. We are going up to 20% increase the last six months, if you see. Compared to last six months, our production is 20% more how would you compare the overall export and realization levels to pre-COVID peaks? See, pre-COVID peak is, that is different. Pre-COVID was, if we, pre-COVID is 100, we must have reached now after the 20% increase, 10 to 20% increase, we would have reached about 80%. I mean to say, still it is 20% gap is there between now and before COVID, COVID position. 15 to 20 percent gap is still there. And we feel that it will, the more business will come. When you say you're exporting footwear, is this any of this is branded or what is the, let's say, the split between branded and non branded? Exporting is their brand. It is not our brand which we are exporting. Their brand is all the exports which is being happening is a good brand, medium high brands of US and the European market. We are not in the cheap category, middle and higher categories of branded products. All the brands, major brands are buying from us, from uh, from India at the moment, yeah. So what would be the average price of, let's say, the export price of uh, footwear? In, uh... in leather shoes, we go between anything between the $18 to $25 average. It can go up and also more and uh, less also. It is an average price of about $20, per pair. X factory, X factory price, which is happening now. If you compare the price, it is almost the same like pre-COVID 
prices almost almost is skipping in. And you said that uh, one thing that has changed is you're seeing new kinds of customers come in or new brands who are coming or approaching you. And do you see that, you know, substantially growing this part of the year and then onwards? The summer season, now the winter season, out of winter, we have seen the increase of 20%. Now we are heading for the spring summer, 25, so spring summer of 25. We also see the same amount of uh, interest uh, there. So, and uh, we believe that it will be, it will continue. The same production level will continue. Though we may not still reach uh, pre-COVID level. It will be still be less than pre-COVID level. Are there any other markets that are opening up apart from the traditional markets of Europe and the United States? No, we have not seen any new markets coming up. Europe has a less problem on China than India. They don't see any political thing coming up into Europe there. But the Europeans mostly buying more from Vietnam than uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia type than uh, U.S. U.S. is the one which is more uh, depending on the Chinese market. So, but anyway, new market, nothing much is coming up. Slightly, we see some demand coming from Japan. But the currency is so bad in Japan, it makes them very difficult at the moment to buy. Otherwise, the interest will be there from Japan market, which is a high quality market there. And from a manufacturing standpoint, are you looking to expand into any other kinds of footwear and where you see opportunity or future demand? Yes. We have uh, seen the, seeing a big opportunity coming up on the sports shoe. Need not be a leather shoe, non-leather shoe also, non-leather and leather mix. Some leather will be mixed up. Huge demand coming up for the uh, thing. These, you see, the, the whole uh, market of sports shoes are controlled by six or seven brands in the world. They dictate the world by 80% of the market. We see that already two, three brands are already in India buying through a Taiwanese companies in India. Now there are other, other brands also coming up for India, both for Indian market and also for the import into other U.S. and other markets. They, and in fact, our company, we are going to, going to have a joint venture with uh, through a, the, the Taiwanese company to sell an American sports brand. And is that finalized? or? Yeah, it is finalized. It is finalized. It's going to be a start in October. Uh, the trial will start in October and it will go up to March. We should be picking up. But with a plan that in the next two years, we will be expanding very big way. That means we need our own new uh, greenfield investment will be there. Greenfield factory we are going. Are you able to share the name of this brand? Or? We are working with New Balance, New Balance. So, and you'll be bringing New Balance to India as well for local manufacturing? Both for the local as well as American, mostly American and European brands, uh, European markets, they will cater. Because we are going to work with the Taiwanese company who has got the experience with them. We've been working for uh, with them for the last few years. And we also feel that that would be a quick way to understand them and then work through a uh, Taiwanese uh, and uh, our people are already there in Taiwan and China and trained up in that factory. Right. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.